Hi everybody, this is Shannon McCall at Duke University Medical Center and today we're going to be talking about um, low-grade dysplasia or tubular adenomas in colon. This is a slide from the USCAP virtual slide box. Um, we're using it for obviously a nonprofit educational purpose here. Um, so let's get started. This is uh, um, a resection of colon. So again, similar to um, uh, all the locations in the GI tract, we have four layers. We have our mucosa uh, up here, which is bounded by muscularis mucosa. We have our submucosal layer here with our connective tissue and blood vessels. We have our muscularis propria, which is composed of an inner and outer uh, smooth muscle layer. And then we have our serosa. Um, as the outside layer of the GI tract. So that's where we are. So this is obviously taken from a large resection specimen. But what we're going to be focusing on is a little bit of uh, mucosal change in this area up here. So let's go to higher power. Now, as you know, uh, current guidelines state that at age 50, um, a patient with uh, no previous um, colonic uh, diagnoses should go in for screening colonoscopy. Um, at that time, the colonoscopist will assess the, for the presence of polyps. Um, and at that point, they will be in the lumen of the colon, and they will be looking for little abnormalities, and they will take a biopsy uh, snip that looks something like this if they see an abnormality. So what we might get uh, to diagnose a biopsy would be more superficial. So um, let's pretend for a moment that we were uh, looking at a biopsy kind of from a very superficial bite of colon mucosa. We'll start over here uh, with a more normal appearing colonic mucosa. Um, the way this looks, um, it's been described classically as test tube appearances. The colonic glands line up like test tubes. Um, and then we look in between the colonic glands at the lamina propria. Uh, the cellularity of the lamina propria varies um, somewhat uh, with regard to location within the colon so that the right colon tends to have a more cellular lamina propria than areas of the left colon. Um, but by and large, it, this is a typical cellularity of the lamina propria. There are some inflammatory cells, but there's also areas of, of kind of open space. So this is a very nice, normal appearance of colonic mucosa. And as we transition into the more uh, abnormal uh, portion, we see uh, a couple of things. First off, architecturally, we see that the glands in this area are closer together. Um, so they're more crowded. The glands are more crowded here than in the normal portion of the mucosa. And then we also can notice some things at a cytologic level. Let's go a little higher power. There we go. So compared to the normal um, here, normal colonic mucosa, um, the epithelium shows basally oriented nuclei with uh, goblet cells. Um, the nuclei are, they don't take up more than kind of half of the height of the cell, um, and they are basally oriented, and they're not particularly crowded or overlapping. Um, by comparison, when we start to look at this epithelial lining, we can see that the nuclei are elongated. They're pencilate, or some people call them cigar-shaped, and they're very close together, um, crowded, overlapping. So this makes us um, begin to worry about low-grade dysplasia, or uh, the synonym for that in the colon is adenomatous mucosa, or low-grade dysplasia. They mean the same thing. Um, traditional adenomatous mucosa and low-grade dysplasia mean the same thing in colon. Um, we also would want to make sure that this change, this nuclear crowding and pencilate uh, structures, persists all the way up to the surface. Um, for a firm diagnosis of low-grade dysplasia or traditional adenomatous mucosa. And in fact, it does. We have surface um, over here, when, and we see that this adenomatous type of epithelium is persisting all the way up to the surface. Now, that distinguishes um, true adenomatous mucosa from um, times at which the epithelium can become reactive, um, based on inflammation, et cetera. In that case, you might see some concerning nuclear changes at the base of the crypts, but they wouldn't necessarily persist all the way up to the surface epithelium. But clearly, we have persistence up to the surface here as well. Um, OK, so now what distinguishes low-grade dysplasia from high-grade dysplasia? Well, this is not high-grade dysplasia. And what's absent here is, uh, on a cytologic basis, what's absent is we do not have kind of rounding up of the nuclei. They tend to they uh, maintain this kind of cigar-shaped, um, pencilate-shaped uh, morphology. They are crowded, as we said, but they're not rounding up. 
and they're not um, taking a place in a very kind of a superficial location within the cell um, and having large irregular nuclear forms. We haven't begun to see that yet and that would be a sign of cytologic high-grade dysplasia. The other thing we don't see is complexity of architecture. So at the first we mentioned that the glands are too crowded um, compared to normal colonic uh, mucosa and they are a little bit more crowded but what they are not is syncytial or complex or cribiform. So we do not see a large gland with multiple kind of lumina within the gland um, and a very complex um, glandular architecture. Um, so that's absent. So we feel pretty comfortable with a diagnosis of low-grade dysplasia or traditional adenomatous mucosa um, here. So um, now polyps, uh, getting back to colonoscopy, if this was snipped off um, and was visible to the colonoscopist, we would just call this a tubular adenoma. Um, sometimes, and maybe we'll look at this in a future slide, these polyps can kind of develop a stalk. Um, this one does not have a stalk, but uh, in either case, um, the endoscopist could submit either a pedunculated or a polyp with a stalk, or what we call a um, sessile type of polyp, a polyp without a stalk. Um, and in either case, the diagnosis um, would be uh, the same tubular adenoma or low-grade dysplasia. And this just puts the, cat, puts the patient in a higher uh, risk stratification group for the development of colon cancer um, in their lifetime, so they'd want to be followed up um, sooner um, rather than uh, waiting an additional 10 years um, for a follow-up colonoscopy. Depending on the number of polyps and the complexity of the polyps, the patient will be brought uh, back sooner for repeat colonoscopy in the hopes of preventing them um, from developing uh, colon cancer. And uh, that's it. We'll see you next time.